Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, as we look for lessons that are therein and how we can apply them to our lives, may your Holy Spirit apply them to our hearts. May we look at ourselves honestly this morning and see where we truly stand with you. I pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit may speak to us, may speak through me, and this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite pioneers in the Adventist church was born in this house here, or grew up in this house. Today it's the Paris Hill Country Club. golf course. It's the home, childhood home of John Nevin Andrews in Paris Hill, Maine. If you've ever been up there to the northeast of America and you've been to some of the Adventist heritage sites, it's a little bit further than the Portland area. You've got to go a little bit deeper into Maine to get there. There's the home where John Nevin Andrews grew up. He was born in 1829. By the time of 1844, he was 15 years old, a young man. In that little town of Paris Hill, Maine, some of our strong pioneers came from. John Nevin Andrews came from there, and then the lady he would go on to marry was born there, and then his sister-in-law, who would go on to be the wife of Uriah Smith, was also born in this small, little, sleepy town. It was in this home, today it's owned by somebody, knowing not the significance of what took place in this home, it was in this home where a Sabbath tract from Thomas Preble landed on the coffee table or dining table, whatever you want to call it. The parents had a chance to read it and maybe not looking at it in detail or maybe dismissing it, they didn't really take the content seriously. It was the child, the 14-year-old daughter, Marion, I believe her name was, who read the tract on the Sabbath and was convicted on the Sabbath and said, hmm, I should keep the Sabbath. She then shared it with her 17-year-old brother, and he also shared her convictions and said, yes, I will keep the Sabbath too. They then went across town, and they shared the Sabbath track with J.N. Andrews, and at the age of 15 or 16 at the time that he was, he was like, hmm, I will keep the Sabbath too. And it's a fascinating account of where you have the teenagers, not the parents, the teenagers reading the tract on the Sabbath and taking on board that Protestant and, and Adventist principle to live according to your conscience and the Word of God and saying, we'll keep the Sabbath. The teenagers decide to keep the Sabbath. The parents then follow. And there in that little town of Paris Hill, Maine, you have this birth, where a key aspect of our movement is, Jay and Andrews, we see these pictures, he looks, to me that just looks not that young. He was 21 when he sat on the publishing committee of the Review and Herald as it started. 21. At 23, he converts Jay and Loughborough. He goes to town to preach, and J.N. Loughborough was a, was, a, was a Sunday preacher, and he comes to town to argue with J.N. Andrews, and J.N. Andrews is able to dispel all of his arguments one by one and convinces him that he should keep the Sabbath. He's ordained at the age of 24. He is the primary person who helped develop in Revelation 13 our understanding of the second beast of Revelation 13, the two horns, lamb-like horns in Revelation 13 that indicate the United States of America. He gets married at the age of 27 after he did get a little bit of a telling off from Ellen White. At 29, he writes the book the history of the Sabbath, a masterpiece. At 29, 
29, he writes the history of the Sabbath. At the age of 35 in 19, eight, sorry, 1864, he is sent by our church to Washington, D.C. to secure non-combatant status for this small fledgling movement of just 4,000 people or so at 35. Some people have called him like Adventism's Melanchthon because any time there was a crisis or an issue that needed to be dealing with, James White was like, Jay and Andrews, can you study that, please? Jay and Andrews, can you study that? It was in 1855, actually, uh, when our church, after keeping the, not our church, well, it wasn't really an official church back then, but the Sabbatarian Adventists, after keeping the Sabbath from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. for eight years, were not still satisfied that keeping the Sabbath from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. was correct. They thought they were correct because Ellen White had a vision in 1847 or 8 where she saw the words, keep the Sabbath from even until even. And they interpreted, they interpreted that even to even as 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. God in his mercy and looking at the big picture says, okay, that's fine. In 1855, James White says to Jay and Andrews, can you study the Sabbath out, please? 1855, what's he? He's 26 or so years old, 25 years old. He presents his paper to the general conference session kind of thing on the Sabbath, six points as to when the Sabbath should be kept. He's not even there. He just writes his paper and sends it. Fascinating to think that the birth of this movement we, in a sense, kept and decided when we would keep the Sabbath based on a theological paper written by a 25-year-old. And he presented six reasons. Day begins at sunset, and, you know, da, 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 all these reasons, and we can't keep the Sabbath from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. because we didn't have watches before 1658. And they all vote, keep the Sabbath. Like he was instrumental in the birth of our church. In 18, sorry, at the age of 38, he becomes the general conference president for one year. The terms were just one year back then. He was the president when there was the first Adventist camp meeting in Wright, Michigan. At the age of 43, his wife dies. 43. Suffers heartbreak. His beloved wife dies. In 1872. She's buried there in the cemetery in, I believe it's Rochester. And two years later, he leaves Boston on a ship and heads to Switzerland as the first official, got to be careful, the first official missionary that our church sent. There were a few people that may have gone out before, not officially sent, and in particular to Europe, there was someone called Michael Chahowski who went earlier, but he wasn't sent by the church because they didn't want to send him, but a very interesting story, he went there to Europe because the Adventist church, Seventh-day Adventist church, wouldn't sponsor him. He goes there to Europe with sponsorship from a first-day church. So when he gets to Europe, he evangelizes people on the Sabbath. So there's a few ethical issues there, I think. But needless to say, he does start churches there in Europe. He doesn't really connect them with the body in America, but he does do a lot of good work there in Europe and starting up churches. And it's one of these groups that does get started that sent, eventually sends a letter to America asking for some help. And they just, I believe they just write a letter, Battle Creek, Adventists, and send it, and it finds its way there to the Adventists in Battle Creek. And, and, and then they, they send Jay and Andrews. By now, he's a single father. He's got two, well, I think his daughter was 12 and his son was 16, two children as a single father, and he goes there on that ship to Europe at the age of 45. As they get there to Europe, they have a very close-knit family. And they have an agreement, a pact, maybe, that they'll only speak French in the home all hours of the day, except I think it was between 5 and 6 p.m. in the evening. 
because they needed to learn the language. He was a, a pioneer missionary. There was no conference in Europe. There was no TED or EUD or whatever they call them today. There was none of those divisions in Europe. There were no conferences. There were no publishing houses. He's going there, and this is at a time when, you know, there's not much travel going on. People haven't really met a lot of Americans, and he's going over there, and he's dealing with prejudice, or he's dealing with a church that doesn't know how much money to give him when they send him, and all those types of things. And as he gets there to Europe, he's starting the work. Doesn't really have enough money. The cost of living in Switzerland is probably slightly higher than Michigan. Not eating well. I believe, don't ask me for a quote, but maybe I'm incorrect. I believe Alan White didn't, did counsel him that maybe it would be better for him to get remarried. Maybe it would have done. Maybe it would have prolonged his life. But he's there in Europe, and his daughter, who's his rock, she's 12 years old when she goes over there, she learns the language very well. She's not called the editor of the signs of the times, but she kind of was. He would write the articles, she would help translate them. At the age, of, what were you doing when you were 12, 13, 14, 15? Enjoying life. Enjoying life. The more carefree your 12s, 13s, 14s, or 15s are, the better life you have. You're not spending your 12s, your 13s, your 14s, your 15s living in a foreign country with no mother, with a father who can't cook, spending your time learning French, self-imposing upon your family that you'll only speak French in your home and not English except for one hour a day, in a foreign land, the age of 16, she catches TB, tuberculosis. Back then, before TB vaccines or whatever, that was kind of like a death sentence. And she gets TB. Jay and Andrews was called back to come back for the GC session or something, and so she travels with her dad, and he wants her to see John Harvey Kellogg prominent doctor, preeminent doctor in America. So he comes back with her, and she's there with him, in, in, and he takes her to see her, and he says, yeah, she's got TB. He advises her not to spend any time with her because he may catch it or may have some impact on his health, but he says, no, no, she's been my rock. She stood by me in Europe. She's been the translator. She's been all of these things. I will stay with her. He stays with his daughter until she dies and passes away. She's also buried there in the cemetery in Rochester, New York. And if you can see the screen there, it says Teenage Adventist Pioneer. It's not quite the correct terminology, but it, it would almost be correct, and this is a little bit of a, a preacher's stretch, it would almost be correct, though it's not quite, to say almost a teenage Adventist martyr. She wasn't killed by anyone, you understand what I'm saying. But she gave her teenage years, she gave her life for this movement. Her time wasn't filled with playing capture the flag and going slip and slide and going tubing and all the things our kids enjoy today. Devoted to our church and to the mission of evangelism and spreading the gospel in places elsewhere. It was at that time that Jay and Andrews wrote, and he was heartbroken. He wrote these words. He said, I seem to be having hold upon God with a numb hand. Ellen White wrote a letter to him where she said, in my last vision I saw you, a hand was inclined towards the earth, and you were following in tears your beloved Mary to her dwelling place in this world. Then I saw the Lord looking upon you, full of love and compassion, and I saw the coming of him who is to give life to the mortal bodies and your wife and, ch and children. 
He had four children born. By now, he's lost three. He lost two early on. Now he's lost his teenage daughter. He just has his son life. He's lost three children at this point. Now your wife and children come out of their graves clad in immortal splendor. Soon after, he travels back to Europe, but his, his, his health never really, um, you could say, is the same. He lives for about four years or so more. His health kind of declines. J.N. Loughborough from England is sent by the GC to go over there to Switzerland to encourage him and to anoint him with oil. Stephen Haskell goes over there to spend some time encouraging him as well. But his health is declining. His health is declining. They, they, they say, come back to America. He's fearful that the journey will kind of finish him off. And he stays there in Europe. When he was sent to Europe, those famous words you've probably seen that Ellen White says, we sent you the ablest man in our ranks. The next part of the sentence we often don't quote, it says, we sent you the ablest man in our ranks. And she goes on to say, at great sacrifice to us. She says, we needed Jay and Andrews here in America, but we sent him to you. The best we had. He dies in Basel, I believe he's around the age of 54. I always wonder what would our church have been like if we had th three more decades of J.N. J. Andrews' service. I believe the outcome of 1888 would have been vastly different. We don't have time to go into details, but essentially he held a similar view to Jones and Wagner, not Uriah Smith and Butler, and, and I think he could have been a glue that would have helped to bring the two sides together because he's a brother-in-law to Uriah Smith. He's older, he's very well respected, and he could have been someone that would have been more of an advocate for the younger ministers. You get what I'm saying? But he wasn't there. He gave a life of total sacrifice or dedication to our church. His daughter gave a life of total sacrifice and dedication to our church. Our sermon title is Total Sacrifice. Now, not every sacrifice we see in the Bible is a total and a complete sacrifice. There are other sacrifices that we see that are kind of like partial, and those are sometimes the sacrifices that we copy and emulate in our lives. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we have one of the first sacrifices in the Bible, and it's a sacrifice that God does not ask for in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, around verses 2 to 4, it's the story of Cain and Abel. And we're told there in verse 2, it says, And she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was the keeper of the sheep, and Cain was the tiller of the ground. And in process of time, verse 3, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel brought also of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto who? Abel and his offering. God wasn't happy with Cain's offering. God asked him to bring a lamb, and Abel brings a lamb, but Cain brings a fruit. Cain reinterprets the, the, the request from God. He brought what he wanted to bring, not what God asked him to bring. It's still a sacrifice what he brought, but it wasn't it wasn't the sacrifice that he was asked to bring. God asked all of us to sacrifice something to him. But sometimes you and I do this. We do it, we do it, we do it. We're like, I know you've asked for that, God. But for now, I'm bringing this. Or not even for now, I know you asked for this, God, I'm bringing you this. God's asking for your time. Your time. I'll give you my money instead, God. I want your time. Dedicate three days a week to me, one day a week to me, whatever. I want your time. No, God. I'll give you this. I don't know. Different for all of us. 
God may be asking for your career. Change course. Divert. Go this way. That's what I want you to do. Mm. Mm. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15, we've got another sacrifice there in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15. And there in 1 Samuel 15, you've got the story of Samuel telling Saul. Verse 2 and 3. Thanks to the Lord. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him on the way and came when he came up from Egypt. God says, I remember. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and spare them not, but slay man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Kill it all, the Amalekites. The cup of their iniquity is full. So I was like, okay, that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear advice. There's no ambiguity there. There's no like, oh, let me interpret it. No, no. That's pretty clear. Verse 7. So Saul smote Amalekites from Havilah until they came to Shur. Verse 8. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people of the edge of the shore. Verse 9. But, but, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. And of the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, they destroyed utterly. So Saul says, okay, I, I know you've told me to kill everything, like all forms of life just to annihilate. I know that's what you said, God, but I'm going to take that advice. I'm going to interpret it. I'm going to contextualize it. And I'm just going to kill that which I see as vile and, 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 and terrible, but that which is good, the good animals. There's no point killing good sheep. Why are we killing the good cows for? I'm not going to kill the good cows. I'm not going to kill the good sheep. We're going to keep those, but, but all of that will do. And then you have that verse in verse, was it 14? Samuel came to Saul, verse 13. And Samuel says in verse 14, I like this verse, he's like, hmm, can you imagine him scratching his head? What means then this? Bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. What's going on here, Saul? I can hear sheep and I can hear cows. What's going on? And and Saul says there in verse 15, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people, for the people, he says there, he's blaming them, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen for the purpose of sacrificing to God. And the rest we've destroyed. The rest we've destroyed. It's later on that Samuel says to Saul, to obey is better than to barter with God. To obey is better than to negotiate with God. To obey, even though it doesn't make sense to you, is better than to to kind of reinterpret God's command. To obey is better than sacrifice. God wanted obedience to his command. And he says, yeah, I'll go save some of those sheep. I'll save some of those lambs. I'll save some of those. You can't negotiate. You can't negotiate service for a lack of obedience. Sometimes we mentally play games in our heads with God. We got a little secret sin on the side, but I'm serving as an elder in the church. We got a little secret sin on the side, but Lord, I am, I'm, I, I'm, I'm singing up front in the church. I'm doing something for you. We negotiate with God. In our minds, we're, we're not really negotiating with God. We're playing mental games in our head. I, I'll do this. 
You just turn a blind eye here. God's like, no, I need your whole heart. You can't come to me and say, but, but, but I'm doing it for a good reason. I'm doing it for a good reason. No. No. You can't just keep that thing on the side, but doing something public for me, and it negates that. No, it doesn't work like that. It's not a case of which part of the scales is heavier than the other. Got an addiction to go into some websites that you know you shouldn't go to. An epidemic that's sweeping through Christianity. The statistics of Christians and non-Christians, men and women, Adventist and non-Adventist, they're the same across the board. They're the same across the board. When you give your child a phone with data, or data, or whatever you say, with a Wi-Fi connection, it's huge. So many people struggle, but Lord, I, 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 I'm serving you in church. God still sees that. One does not negate the other. We can't negotiate our spiritual life with God and, and ask for a, a pass. We can't. We just can't. Don't negotiate with God, church. In Matthew chapter 7, there will be many people that come to God and they're negotiating with God. God says, I don't know you. And they say, but Lord, we preached. But Lord, we healed. But Lord, we cast out demons. Don't know you. It's interesting that Matthew chapter 7 is all public things. They don't come to God and say, but Lord, I was really, I was really, I was really kind. But Lord, but Lord, I had the fruits of the Spirit. They don't come to God and say that in Matthew chapter 7. They come to God with all the public things they've done. Lord, I've preached. Lord, I've served in your church. Lord, I was a volunteer at camp meeting for 30 years in a row. Lord, I've done all of these things. Surely it gives me some credit in the bank. And it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 25, when you've got the sheep and the goats, and you've got a group of people, they get recognized by, 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 by God, and they say, when, when did we do that? All the things in Matthew 25 are all the stuff that happens, generally speaking, in private. You, you, you healed, you, you fed the sick, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. When did we do that to you, Lord? Well, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. There's a contrast between Matthew 25, where you've got private stuff. Matthew 7, where you've got public stuff. The people that come to God and say, God, I did this for you. Can't negotiate. I want your heart. I mean, ultimately, I mean, even this, even though I'm talking about some martyrs, and I even talk about one today, you know, ultimately, it's not even enough to give your life for God. Amen? Why? Because 1 Corinthians 13 says, Though I give my body to be burned and have not, it profits me what? Indicating that there may even be some martyrs who won't make it because though they gave their physical life, they had never given their spiritual hearts fully. It could have just been stubbornness. It could have just been determination. It could have just been whatever, but it was never a full surrender, maybe. My guess is that will be a smaller minority, but it, 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 it means it's possible. You can even sacrifice your physical life without giving your spiritual heart to God. But Lord, I died for you. You never gave me your heart. Turn to Acts 5. Acts 5. Acts 5. In Acts 5, you've got a different type of sacrifice. In Acts chapter 5, you've got a different type of sacrifice. You've got two people here who have pledged money. They've pledged a gift to the church. 
There's a man named Ananias and his wife is Sapphira, and they sold a possession. But the Bible says they kept back part of the price. Now what happens, we, we know, they, they, they sold this field, and they pledged to give all the money to the church, cause of God. But after they've made that pledge, they then start to regret giving all that money to the church. And they say, hmm, let's keep it back. But then they see how well the other church members are received when they make large donations to the church. So initially they regret their sacrifice, but then they're like, oh wow, do you see brother so-and-so who donated money to the evangelistic campaign? And boy, did you see how well he was received? Did you see that sister who sponsored two Bible workers? Mm. We've sold the field for a hundred thousand. Let's keep back thirty. We'll give seventy. So we'll still get the applause of the church because they'll think, oh wow, they gave seventy. They don't know the Lord's convicted us to give 100. They don't know that. So we'll give 70. We'll look good in the eyes of all the other church members. They'll think we're really sacrificial. They'll think we were really donated to the cause. And we'll gain in the esteem of our brothers. But we'll still keep a little bit for ourselves. Mm -mm. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, after it was sold, was it not in your power? Verse 5, and Ananias, hearing those words, fall down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all those who heard these things. His wife also died. First of all, they regret their sacrifice, but then pride comes in, so they kind of have this partial sacrifice that's not a full sacrifice. They only want to serve or they only want to give if they'll get recognition for giving, and I talked about that earlier this week of some of us in church that only want to serve, we only want to do stuff if we get publicly recognized for it. Matthew 25 is not public recognition, Matthew 7 is. Matthew 7 is public. Matthew 25 is largely private. And there's too many people that want public recognition for service. I remember once I was doing a, a graduation ceremony and, and a, a certain minister was asked to say a prayer in the service. This issue caused me and a friend of mine and another friend of mine about three or four hours of phone calls in the, in, 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 in the week afterwards. Let me tell you what the issue was. I stand there and I say, and now Pastor so-and-so will come and say the prayer. I've introduced him and say the prayer. After he says the prayer, he sits down. Senior minister, look up to him. Because I then didn't go back up and say, I would like to thank Pastor so-and-so for saying the prayer. Three hours of phone calls. Because he wasn't thanked. I really don't get it. Just don't. And maybe it's an extreme example, but some of us, you know, when I would run events, I was youth director, run all these events, and people would always tell me, run all these events, run all these events. And I always get to the end, and there's always that time, and I don't know if you do it here in Michigan Camp, me, and every culture, every culture in the church is different, and every ethnicity handles these things differently. In some cultures, it's very important to list everybody who's helped. Every single body who's helped. And I would always be told by me, be very careful getting into that because once you get into that, it's a road and a rabbit hole you can't get out of. 
You just can't get out of it because it means the closing program just becomes and you miss one. Oh. Potentially, if it's the wrong person that you've missed, you're in big trouble now. Big, big, big trouble. I find easier just as I thank you to all the AV, thank you to all the ushers, thank you to all the deacons, thank you to everybody. May the Lord bless you. Let's not serve God for need of recognition, amen? amen? Let's not serve God for need of position. Let's serve God to serve God whether we're recognized or not because there's going to be a whole load of people on the final day who come to God with their credentials and asking them why they're not allowed into the city. And God says, I didn't know you. You never gave me your heart. I was after your heart. I was after your heart and you negotiated with me, but it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. God is looking for a total, a total sacrifice. This here is St. Mary's Church in Oxford, England. It's the home of Oxford University before they built all the colleges in the 11 or 1200s, where exactly when it was started. That building was Oxford University, the, um, the spire. The building to the left is a, is, is a library. I've shared with you the story this week already of Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer who went to the fire, but he, he kind of recanted before he went to the fire, and then he regained his courage, and when he got to that spot there on the ground, he, got, he gets to that spot, and he holds his hand there in the flames. And I, I always love to go to Oxford and visit this spot, and it's always fascinating to me to see the people just walk over it. The bicycles ride their bikes over it, and people just don't know that it's there. In fact, the first time I went there, I went with uh, one of your pastors from this conference, Pastor Steve Conway, years ago when we were in college, and he was visiting England, and I was never been there myself, and so I go there to Oxford, and I'm trying to find the spot, and, and I ask a policeman, say, hey, officer, and we were standing literally 40 meters away, I say, Mr. Officer, where's the spot where of, that commemorates Ridley and Latimer? And the policeman looks to me, and he says, Ridley, Latimer, who are those chaps? And I said, the martyrs, the martyrs. And he looked back at me in indignation and in his Oxford accent says, martyrs? Here in Oxford? Yep, martyrs here in Oxford, sir. He called on his radio and found it was literally from here to the camera away. He didn't know it was there. And so we go and find this spot. And on this spot there, as I've said, you've got two dates. You've got 1555 and 1556 when Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley died earlier and Thomas Cranmer died later. The issue that was the debate at the time was communion. That was the life and death issue, so to speak, for the reformers at the time. Is the bread the literal body of Jesus or is it a symbol or is it something else? Hugh Latimer was very clear on what he thought the bread was. He said the bread is just a symbol of Jesus. Nothing changes in the bread at communion. The change at communion is in the heart of the believer. Now, I've shared with you already the little, you know, King Henry and his wife, so you've got King Henry, then you've got Edward who comes after him, and then you've got the nine-day queen that comes after Edward, and then Mary the Catholic queen who comes there and she's trying to return England back to Catholicism and she goes on a mission. She's on a witch hunt to get all of these, these Protestant leaders and, and, she, and she arrests them one by one. But Hugh Latimer was about 67, 68 years old at the time. He was very well respected across the country. He was a very, very popular preacher. He didn't actually at this time hold a bishopric. He wasn't a bishop of an area, but he was very well respected and... and when you look at the events, you can kind of glean maybe what's going through her minds because what they did, what they did is when they came to arrest him, when they came to arrest him, if you look here on the screen, when they came to arrest him, um, here, Hugh Latimer was given about six weeks when he could have fled as many Protestant leaders did. It's, a, it, it's kind of a, a fascinating, a weird aspect of history. So what happens is, Somebody heard that he's going to get arrested. His name was John Careless. I mean, what a name. 
So John careless hears that Hugh Latimer is going to get arrested and he's a friend or he knows him. So he comes to see him and he says, you're going to get arrested. They're going to come in a few weeks. Now that could have been a signal. What a lot of Protestants did is they fled to Europe, made their way to a ship port. They got on a ship to France and they made their way across and they went to, they went to Geneva. Geneva was like the bastion of Protestantism. Some have called it the Protestant Rome during that time. It was a safe place to be. And John Knox went there, a few other people went there. And he could have gone there, he could have fled to Geneva, but, but no. He warned him that he's going to get locked up. He doesn't run. The king's officer came to see him, but doesn't arrest him. The king's officer, when he came, merely says, you will be arrested, and you need to be in London on the 13th of September. Now, some of us would have said, the Lord has parted the Red Sea for me. He didn't arrest me. It's time for me to lickety-split, get out of here. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't get out of there. The Queen's officer doesn't arrest them and just says, come to London on September the 13th. The pursuant, having delivered his summons, returned to London, leaving Latimer to follow. The unwanted conduct, Bertha, thinks, was adopted by the express orders of the council to allow Latimer the opportunity of escaping, for they knew that the constancy should deface them in their popery and confirm the godly in the truth. It is by no means an improbable supposition that the council did hope to work upon his fears and begged all question, it would have been a great triumph for the Romish party if they could have induced so conspicuous a champion of the Reformation as Latimer to abandon his post through fear of personal injury. Like, let's not arrest this one. Let's just scare him and see what he does. Come to London on September the 13th. What does he do? What does he do? He shows up. He shows up. He said these words, My friend, you are a welcome messenger to me, and be it known unto you and to all the world that I go as what? Willing to London at this present, being called by my prince to render a reckoning of my doctrine as ever I was at the place in the world, I doubt not but that God, as hath made me worthy to preach his word before the excellent princes, so will he able to witness the same unto the Lord, either to her comfort or discomfort eternally. He says, no. Summarize that. It's my time to go there. And October the 13th, September the 13th, 1553, or 4, sorry, he appears of his own free will in London. He gets sent to the Tower of London, probably marched through Traitor's Gate, and he's locked up. It was a magnificently courageous recognition of the fact that where great issues are involved, sorry, it was a magnificently courageous recognition of the fact that where great issues are involved, there comes a time when the bravest of men cannot give ground. He wasn't just a martyr, but he recognized, he's like, I've lived a good life. It's time for me to go and stand before the Queen of England it's time for me to go stand before the councils and give an account. I will not run. I will not hide. I will not allow them to think that I'm scared of the fire. I'm there going to London of my own free will. Even though I've got tipped off, I can escape. And he shows up. And it was a remarkably courageous recognition of the fact that when there's great issues involved, the greatest of men cannot give any ground. 
shows up, goes to the trial, and he's tried and he's killed, and they take him to that spot there on the ground, and it was on that spot on the ground where he said those famous words to Ridley. He was the older man. He was 68 or 69. Ridley was slightly younger, and he does those famous words as they're tied back to back with the stake there, and he says, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light a candle by God's grace in England that shall never be put out. He died soon after that, but they say Ridley died a, a slow and a, a more painful death, but no doubt encouraged by the words of his, of, of his comrade, we shall this day light a candle that shall never be put out. They gave the total sacrifice of their lives. They weren't negotiating with God. They weren't regretful. They weren't holding something back. They weren't bringing something wrong. They recognized there was great issues at stake. And they recognized that as a church at that time in the church's history, they could not give any ground on what they saw and what is a key fundamental belief and teaching about who Jesus is. We have a heritage church of people who've given a great sacrifice for us. Our pioneers, the reformers, but ultimately it's Jesus Christ who gave the total sacrifice. Amen? Jesus says, I'll go down to earth, I'll give a total surrender, I'll die a lonely death, I'll have a complete and utter submission to my Father, I'll be separated from you forever, it's a total sacrifice, I will give up heaven, I'll give up fellowship with the angels, I'll die the second or the eternal death, I'll give up everything, totally, not for three days, I'll give up everything for eternity, so one can make it to paradise. God gave all for you. And he asks us in response to give up the little that's around us. The little that's around us that we're told in the writings of Ellen White, then when we'll get to heaven, we'll look around and we'll say those words, heaven was cheap enough. What cheap things are you holding on to today? Ambition, attitude, Material things, just holding on to cheap things. It's time to let those cheap things go. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, Lord, I want to ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and impress upon us what cheap things we're holding on to. Maybe it's a career, maybe it's a job, maybe it's a position. Maybe it's a hobby, maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's just an attitude we have to another sister or brother in church that we just don't want to let go. What are those cheap things impress upon our hearts, Lord? Lord, may we be willing to surrender all in a total sacrifice to you. Bless us throughout this day. May your spirit strive with us, convict us, humble us, convert us, and lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.